Hmm, almost. Ah yes, that's it. Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my landing. I have been renovating the upstairs of my house now for five and a half years and I've just come to putting some of the finishing touches up. I was in a place called Horncastle and I came across this Victorian carriage lantern, the kind where you'd have one on each side of your horse and carriage, and I thought, ah yes, this is exactly what I need to liven that bit of wall up. All I require, of course, to mount it is some kind of bracketry, and that is the topic of today's video. I need to make something that is in keeping with the style to mount this on a wall, and ideally it wants to be fairly simple, fairly straightforward to manufacture, and made from bits and pieces I have lying around. made from things that I have lying around. Okay, I've had a rummage and first of all the wall plate. Well, I found this and based on this swarf I think it was probably trepanned out of a larger sheet at some point. That will make the wall plate. Coming from that will be a strut and to improve the join where the two attach I'm going to make a something to support and that something will be made out of this. Now, don't ask me what this is. It's certainly not one of my screw cutting exercises and I'm not actually old enough to have had one of my work pieces get that tarnished. So I have no idea what it is, but it is going to become a improvement on the design. And on the end of the strut will be a piece that fits around this oval section. A few moments have passed and I have now prepared the pieces. Now I've had a little change of mind. I was going to make the centre section out of this um, thing. However, whilst at the lathe I thought, oh hang on, are the aesthetics going to be right here? Because I would have had brass, 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 and then this slightly different shade of bronze. Now I was thinking, hang on, that might make it look like I just ran out of brass. So to be on the safe side, I've changed it up a bit and I've decided to make the middle section out of what is very definitely a deeper colour. I believe that to be bronze. So it's going to go brass, bronze, brass again, and then a different shade of bronze on the top. And combined with the copper and the silver, I think overall it's more aesthetically pleasing than having something that was nearly all brass. OK, with that said, it is time to join these bits together. I am now going to carry out a silver soldering operation. I have set the fire bricks up, I've cleaned all the parts using a brand new scotch bright pad that is not contaminated with anything and I have mixed up a paste flux and I am now fluxing the components. Now the more I look at this the more I think it could actually be copper. Uh, I've been and compared it to the central heating pipes and uh, yeah, it could well be copper. Now, by the way, I've taken a V-shaped file and I've put some V-nicks down this bore because it's quite a close fit on the diameter and I want to make sure the silver solder can run all the way through. soldered to me. Right, I'm going to let this cool a little, put it in the quench and then I'm going to bring that bronze ring out and I'm going to anneal it. 
with this you just wait until the silver solder takes a matte effect and then it's okay as you move. That was the quenching of the bronze ring. All has now cooled off and the silver soldering went to plan. Nothing wrong there, typical silver solder joints. The bit that didn't go to plan quite however was the annealing. Now I've never had this effect before but just as it got to the annealing temperature something flashed silver and you may have noticed as I tipped it into the water there was two different colours going on. Well that can still be seen in terms of the salmon pink versus the gold. Now I, as I say, have never seen this before. Someone out there will know what's going on and perhaps I ought to explain that this annulus of uh, bronze came as an offcut from the machine shop in Selby Shipyard when it closed in about 1993. So the chances are that Selby Shipyard had this for some kind of bearing material and having, you know, with that in mind, I've done a little bit of research and there's two potential theories. One is that this is some kind of bronze with another material added to help its bearing properties, perhaps some kind of leaded bronze. The other theory is that because it came as an annulus rather than a solid, perhaps it had been sintered into that form, in which case it might have had tin in it. Was it the tin that melted out and went silver? Either way, it was interesting. It's still, I believe, going to take the form I want it to okay, but I'm actually going to change my plan slightly. I was going to shape this, machine the other one, set it all up, and then silver solder them back together. But silver solder is a little fussy, and I think this, if it starts playing up, could affect the success of a silver soldering operation, so I'm actually going to go for a screwed fit in the end. But apart from that, uh, that's where we are. So, on to a bit of machining. That was, by the way, general purpose, easy flow silver solder, about 40% silver and a melting point of 650 degrees Celsius. Uh, that happens to be an old batch that still has cadmium in it, which is now banned. It's poisonous, but it helps it to flow well. Now, the machining operations are going to be as follows. I'm going to start this way around, machine the back, machine myself a work holding diameter, then I will hold that diameter support with the tailstock at this end and machine the profile. I will get a nicer surface finish using a lapped sharp edge rather than this uh, sintered edge. Let's see if that makes any difference. After lapping, that is now a nice sharp edge um, compared to the typically presented sintered edge that these inserts have. Still negative rake, but sharper. So that's a bit more like it and what I did there was I lapped the edge, dropped the spindle speed and I also gave it a heavier than typical finish cut to load the tool up, load the workpiece up and stop it from ringing. That has done the job and I'll now proceed with the rest of the features.
Right, well that was a bit of ornamental turning. Don't take the sequencing too seriously there. I was just adding features as I decided to add them, so there was no real method to uh, what order that was done in. Right, onto the holding ring. I now turn to the experimental portion of this video and somehow I have to make something fit around this oval. Now what I have opted to do is to machine this annulus and I have made the circumference of the internal bore equal in length the distance round the oval. So in theory if I can change the shape of this circle into an oval the distance round the two should be the same equaling the same size oval. Now I'm expecting that I will have to finish this by filing to shape but it should at least give me something of the right size. So how am I going to turn this into an oval? Of course I'm going to squash it. The scene is set, I've got two sets of calipers and this is my idea. One set of calipers represents what the long dimension of the oval should be and the other set of calipers represents what the short dimension should be so hopefully they uh, tie up and I'm just basically going to see what happens when I start squashing this. <coughs> I think I require some clamps. The nice thing about this method is you can let it relax and then you know you're dealing with the actual true form rather than it's still under any elastic straining. So basically I have set this now so that the error is the same in both directions. So let's see how that marries up with the actual article. So the oval appears to be about right, it's just a slightly different shape oval, but really this thing is quite uh, crude. There's a seam running along this back here, so I think I may try just squashing it back out a very small amount. It's a bit better. I'm going to see if the press will let me squash it this way at an angle. Uh, so far I have just tried pressing either straight across or straight down. I'm going to try going across at an angle. It may not like it and it may jump out of the press but we'll uh, have a go. I'm just looking straight down and I'm seeing where the gaps are. So I'm looking straight down there and I'm seeing where the gaps are. See the daylight? And I'm going to try and pick a direction to squeeze it to close any remaining gaps. I have got it as oval as possible in a symmetrical fashion. But what it is now requiring is a bit of a pincer movement on one side. Effectively I've got to try and squash this back down but not squash this. So going across the centre line won't work anymore. I've got to try and squeeze it across here. So what you are watching is my latest idea. That could well become Mr. Crispin's latest disaster when a, a wedge flies out and goes through the window. But what I'm thinking of doing is squashing it. Maybe if I can get this. That definitely squashed it. Well that is about as close as this is going to get by means of squashing it and I will now proceed with some filing.
I am happy with the bore condition and I am now putting on an internal chamfer on both sides. Internal chamfer is done and I am now going to go around the outside with a flat file and smooth off any bits I feel require it. For my next trick I'm going to put some patterning in this all the way around. Now I did consider turning some profiles in as a form of a pattern but I decided not to at the time because I thought if this was a funny shape it might not squash very easily and might start twisting but in hindsight I think it would have been okay so I could have turned a pattern in here first and I think that pattern would have maintained itself and it would have squashed evenly uh, but I have opted not to do that so I shall be doing it by hand. The finished component takes its form and I shall shortly be doing some polishing. I'll also mention that this now slides on up to about there so that will do the job fine. <coughs> I ended up filing a little uh, groove out to clear the seam. Don't let the instructor see. I have drilled and tapped a hole in the bronze ring. I have given them both two coats of lacquer and it is time to Loctite them together. While I'm calling it a day here, I'm going to let the Loctite dry overnight and tomorrow, once everything has set, I'll carry out a wall mounting ceremony. Time to light up and I thought I'd mention that I've made a aluminium cup to sit in where the burner once would have been. Now I'm not actually sure if this design had a burner or a candle. Early ones had a candle. Um, if I remove the tube for you. So there's a spring in there which makes me think perhaps it was a candle design but then the top looks more like a burner design so I'm not actually uh, sure but it would have been one or the other. And that sits in there and then I'm just going to use a tea light to sit in there and uh, that puts everything at about the right height for the various mirrors that should create the lighting effect. A red light so you can see red at the rear. Well, personally, I consider that a success. Right, home James, don't spare the horses. So that was the story of Mr Crispin's carriage lantern. And all that remains is to say thank you for watching. I hope you found this interesting and see you on the next video.